Welcome back to Introduction to CFD. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about algebraic equation systems, that is, linearized sets of equations which are solved with linear algebra solvers. And we'll be talking about their connection to linear system of equations and motions, which some CFD problems are reduced to from the Navier-Stokes equations. For example, numerical potential flow solvers will yield a linear set of system of equations which can be solved with these types of methods. In the previous class, we talked about stability analysis for particular sets of PDEs and derived CFL numbers. We also did this in the nonlinear set of equations. We also looked at the residual in L1 and L2 norms, and we looked at convergence of solvers. We'll also look at some of these issues in this class and illustrate it through one simplified approach called the Scree approach. In this class, we'll talk about algebraic system of equations, that is, system of equations and their derivation from PDEs, and we'll look at particular solution approaches. In fact, we'll look at some of the most popular ones, like Gaussian elimination and LU decomposition. This will also be very important later when we're talking about preconditioning methods, which use linear algebra to precondition the coefficient matrix of the equations of motion. We showed some of these coefficient matrices in the class on stability analysis. Let's recall some properties of algebraic system of equations. First, for steady problems and sometimes unsteady problems that use inner loops, we might use algebraic linear system of equations and their associated solvers. This is done within the CFD code. So all the linear algebra theory can apply, be applied to CFD even though we're looking at nonlinear solvers. They can also be used directly to solve the linearized problems. We have not discussed their formation or solution. For now, we can assume that we can derive these matrices like a x equals b and solve them using these methods. Now the solution techniques are mainly drawn from linear algebra itself and its theory which has been developed over hundreds of years. Of course algebra is one of the oldest mathematical subjects. Now some solvers and techniques shown here are very unique and very specialized and useful for CFD. We'll show one simplified approach later in this class. If we're solving a linearized set of equations or linear system of equations in computational fluid dynamics, then of course we can set that linear system in an algebraic form using a coefficient matrix A, its solution vector x, and right-hand side B. We can find a corresponding residual by subtracting B from both sides. We would want to drive the residual to zero in an iterative or direct solver to find the solution, and these of course would be the solution vectors of the equations of motion at every grid point. Now, if we have a nonlinear system of equations and we linearize them, we can also form linear sets of equations and solve those too. These are usually talked about and discussed in the so-called perturbation techniques of computational fluid dynamics. But think about the consequences of taking a nonlinear set of equations and linearizing them. It is a humongous assumption. And the nonlinear terms in high-speed aerodynamic flows, for example, or any high Reynolds number flow, are very, very large. And this linearization can often not be performed, except for like a linearization or perturbation analysis. We talked about some of these analysis earlier in the class when we looked at, of course, the um, linearization or derivation of, say, the transonic equations. Now, we can take any form of equations and linearize them, or we might already have a linear set of equations. And we can write, after discretization of those equations, the linear set of equations in the form shown on the top of this page. We might have a sub p of phi p plus a summation of l of a l phi l equals q p. Let's define these variables in this general equation. Here, we'll let p denote the nodes at which the partial differential equation is approximated. The index L will run over the neighboring nodes involving in its finite difference approximation. The coefficients of A L, for example, will depend on geometric quantities, fluid properties, and nonlinear equations, perhaps, and variables of themselves, but not linear ones. Phi, of course, is our unknown solution vector. QP will contain all the terms which do not contain unknown variables. That's very much like AX equals B. B is the right-hand side of the equations, which is not dependent on unknown variables. In the equation of motion, that might be some sort of like source term, just like a constant. And of course, we presume we know all the sources Q, 
we also should know all the coefficients of a, of course. Of the lower right of this page, we have shown particular discretization techniques, which we discussed at length previously, to form linear sets of equations like this shown in its general form. Now, the number of unknowns in the system of equations and the equations must be equal. That is, if we have more unknowns than equations, we will not be able to perform the solution. If we have less unknowns than the number of equations, we will not be able to find a solution either. Typically, there will be at least one equation per grid point. In computational fluid dynamics, we'll have more than one equation per grid point. Typically, we might have anywhere from like three or four or five or maybe 12 equations per grid point. That means for every grid point, we would have 12 equations and 12 unknowns. This would translate directly into the linear system. The order of the matrix, the coefficient matrix, will be the same as the number of unknowns and equations in the corresponding computational grid. This means that there might be a result of a very large set of equations that must be solved numerically. That is, they're solved simultaneously. They can be solved through iterative methods or implicit direct methods in linear algebra. We'll talk a little bit about those both. Basically, an iterative method tries to solve and change the solution vector phi over time to reduce the residual. A direct solver tries to find the matrix that is the solution directly without doing iterative. That is, the direct method will try and find the solution without iterative techniques. Typically, in computational fluid dynamics, the coefficients of the matrix A, that's the coefficient matrix, will be sparse. That means that most elements in the matrix A will be zero. It has a very sparse nature. There are very, very, very few non-zero values. Typically, a sparse matrix in CFD will only have perhaps, perhaps a 1% or less non-zero values in the A matrix. A dense matrix A would mean that most values in the elements of A are non-zero. This is very suddenly the case in computational fluid dynamics. The good thing is it means that we can try and solve our equations of motion with specialized linear algebra solvers. We'll talk about one in this class. It's very simple. Now, we can rewrite our equations from this complicated form into, of course, a form of A phi equals Q. Here, A is a square matrix whose order or number of rows or columns corresponds to the number of equations and number of unknowns in the grid. For example, if we have a 2D domain, which is 10 by 10 grid points, that would mean that we have 100 grid points total. If we're solving one equation, like the Laplace equation, we would have 100 unknowns, and A would have an order of 100. Its total size, of course, would be 100 squared. Phi is a vector, and its order, or size, is 100 in this case for a 10 by 10 grid solving a single equation. So every unknown variable is represented in the vector phi. If you multiply through the coefficient matrix A by phi, you would, of course, recover the left-hand side of the equations shown previously. Then you would have the right-hand side, Q. Typically, Q might contain many zero values if there's no source term in like a CFD problem. Q often takes on non-zero values at boundary conditions. Typically, in most CFD problems, Q is also sparse, meaning it only contains a few non-zero values, which are usually close to the boundary conditions. Remember, A is a square matrix, which is sparse. It is coefficients of constants. Phi is our vector of unknowns, which is a column, and Q is the right-hand side column vector which of course represents the source terms and is mostly also sparse and mainly zero. Now, the structure of A is very important in computational fluid dynamics, and it will be ordered for structured computational domains. If you create A for a linear problem from an unstructured domain, then the coefficients of A usually will not have much structure. If you have a finite difference approach and you discretize a linear equation and form the coefficients of A, you will most find that there's some lexicographic ordering that is an ordering shown. It could be that the diagonal terms of A are non-zero and most diagonals are fully zero. Now, a matrix is usually polydiagonal. The matrix A is polydiagonal, meaning it has multiple strong non-zero diagonals in A for structured grids using finite difference routines. In fact, if you have a linear set of equations and use a finite volume approach, you can also rewrite the coefficient matrix and find one for particular grids that are structured um, that are derived from finite difference. It's very interesting. Now, 
let's talk about another example. If we have a five-point computational stencil for differencing, finite differencing, it will yield non-zero coefficients on the main diagonal, diagonal of A and two neighboring diagonals for, of course, the five-point stencil for, say, uh, derivative like partial, partial x. That means it'll have one coefficient on the diagonal and two off-diagonal coefficients to the left and right of the main diagonal of A. Removed by, of course, n positions from the main diagonal. n will be the number of grid points in one particular direction. All other coefficients in that particular row of A will be zero. Remember, every row of A represents a particular equation and its coefficients, which are discretized. The main diagonals of A will be represented by the discretization on the computational domain. This is generally how A is formed, and we can show examples in class if you're interested. It will be and yield a very efficient linear algebra solver through this discretization, especially if our matrix A is diagonally dominant. And there's specialized linear algebra solvers that can handle these types of matrices. We can actually very efficiently store the diagonals of A as dense vectors. That is, if most elements of A are zero, there's no point in storing them in the computer. We might only store the location of the values in A and their values. We do not have to store the entire matrix A as a two by two array in say Fortran or our programming language of course. This is gonna just use a lot of memory and it's no use storing a lot of zeros in memory if we know that millions and millions of values in A of course are zero. This is usually how linear algebra solvers for sparse matrices are written in practice. Let's look at one example in two dimensions. Let's say we have the equation shown at the top of the page. It is a discretization of a particular equation. And it is written as a of l to the l minus nj of phi of l minus nj plus additional coefficients operating on phi. Remember, a sub ij will be the value of the coefficients at location i, j in the array. These are all constant. Phi's are the unknown values. So phi of say i equals one would be located at the top of the column vector and phi of say n would be the last element. Q of course is the vector on the right hand side. This is just like ax equals b which most students are familiar with but we're just calling it a phi equals q. Now this discretization using central differencing of the particular equation you'll see results if we plot non-zero values of A in the matrix A will yield particular bands in the matrix. So this is, of course, a diagonally dominant matrix. And the matrix A, of course, is structured. There's very efficient numerical schemes to solve A. We might also write each equation in this form, which is much simpler. You can see now we wrote A, W, phi, W. W is west, S is south, N is north, and E is west. P, of course, is the main diagonal. Now, for unstructured grids, we do not normally get a nice structured mesh like, or matrix A like this. We'll get something which is more random in nature, and we'll have to use a more general sparse matrix solver to solve the system A phi equals Q. But you can see the beautiful thing about like a structured domain with its discretization for a linear system always results in these beautiful matrices that has so much symmetry and mathematical properties, which can be most efficient for our numerical solvers. This is what is the advantage of a structured grid for linear algebra solvers and problems in fluid dynamics. Let's now turn our attention to ways to solve A phi equals Q. Our whole objective is the discretization approach is to find the coefficient matrix A and then to find the boundary conditions, which of course affect Q. Now that we have this problem set up, we have to develop a solver. Previously, we talked about solvers for mainly nonlinear and linear equations that march in time or iterate to a steady solution. This type of solver might find the particular solution of the partial differential equation with a single type of operation. These solvers are linear algebra solvers, and let's look at some now. The first and most basic approach, of course, is Gaussian elimination. It is the most famous approach and, of course, named after the mathematician Gauss. The basic approach can be outlined at the top of the slide. First, the equations are man manipulated to eliminate the single unknowns at a time in the form of an upper or lower triangular matrix A. 
For example, here, we would try and eliminate the two lower diagonals and retain all the non-zero values in the upper part of the matrix above the main diagonal. So all these terms where my cursor is would be, of course, where non-zeros are formed and all the values in the lower part of the figure, excuse me, matrix A would be all zeros. This is the process and objective of Gaussian elimination. Why do we do that? Because, of course, the last equation, which is the last row, would only have one non-zero in A, A sub say mn, which is the maximum value where my cursor is of the coefficients of a, that is it's its last column and row, would be just a coefficient times phi equals q. That is now we have a closed form equation for a phi equals q. Then through a process of substitution, we know phi at this value and the next two coefficients would be say a sub ij times this next coefficient, which corresponds to the coefficient times the last value of phi in the phi vector, would be equal to the right-hand side q at an element which is one less than the max elements in q. Anyway, you can see that we can do this back substitution all the way back up the matrix if we put the matrix in its upper or lower triangular form. This is the idea of Gaussian elimination. Create that upper or lower triangle and do back substitution to find all the values of phi is, of course, we are doing substitution equations one and another. This is exactly what you've done as students when you were learning algebra, when you're solving two equations with two unknowns. You substitute one equation into the other. Essentially, you've done Gaussian elimination, didn't know it, for a two by two matrix A with constant coefficients and unknowns phi and q. This can be illustrated in these steps here on the left. Say we have matrix A and right-hand side B. We can manipulate the first form into the second form with the so-called forward elimination technique. And then we would do backward substitution on the right to find the values of x1, x2, x3, etc. For example, using this upper triangle, we would find the value of x3 first, which would be b3 double prime over a33 double prime. Note the values of double prime prime and no prime are not derivatives. They just correspond to the values of a, b, for example, at the two particular steps of forward and backward elimination respectively. You can show how we have this original linear algebra form of coefficients a11, a12, etc. and put in the matrix as a11, a12, a13, etc. So here's the first equation which appears in the first row of the original matrix. The second step of course is forward elimination. Now it's very obvious how you might do the forward elimination. Let's look at the particular algorithm now. The backward substitution step is the easiest to understand. The forward elimination step, of course, is the most difficult. One might ask how we do the forward elimination. Let's look at it as an algorithm for the first step. First, we reduce the system to an upper triangular system. This is the process of forward elimination. For this particular system, the first step from row two relative to row one would be a21 times x1 plus a21 over a11, a12, x2, plus a21 over a11, a13, x3, etc., all the way up to a21, a11, a1n, xn, equals the right-hand side a21, a11, b1. Recall b is the right-hand side vector. b1 is the first element in the vector. x1 is the first element in the solution. You can see that originally, we have what equation? We have a21x1 plus a21a12x2, etc., all the way up to a21a1xn equals a21b1. Now, the first equation needs no modification because all its terms that are non zero are above the upper triangle. So the first operation we perform must be on the second equation, which starts with coefficient a21 and a22, etc., all the way up to a2n, b2. You can see here, this equation here. So what we've done is use the first equation and second of equation and combine them, of course, by subtracting the second equation to find this form. And you'll find a22 minus a21 over a11 times a12, etc all the way up. And if you simplify this, of course, with the right-hand side subtraction, that is subtracting from the second equation, you'll find this equation, a22x2 plus additional terms of a2n prime xn equals b2 prime. Here, the primes denote the new values within the particular elements. And you'll see that we're guaranteed to drop the a21x1 term because we've subtracted it out explicitly.
This is amazing. This is done iteratively to find every subsequent equation within the entire Gaussian matrix. This is computationally expensive and not the most efficient way, and perhaps it's almost impossible to solve large linear algebra systems in this method. Anyway, the new system of equations for the upper triangle for equation one and one and two will now be written in this way. You can see we still have the original equation for the first equation of the first row right here. The second equation is now modified, but you can see the a21x1 element is now zero and we drop it. The other coefficients have been modified with primes. So a22 is no longer a22 in this equation, it's now a22 prime. I suggest you work out these steps on your own so you can fully understand it. There's no other way to do this. We would operate on the next equation, which would of course be a32, etc., all the way up to an. We would label all the new coefficients with primes. The last equation, of course, would only have one non-zero coefficient, which would be a n n prime. Now that we've gone through the equations and found the upper triangle, we can perform our backward substitution. The triangular pro process can be illustrated right here in these two sets. And I encourage you to read through them on your own to see if you can understand the algorithm. Once you do, it'll be very simple to understand. At first, it's very complicated. Now the solution can be formed by back substitution, which I just discussed. Let's look at one example of Gaussian elimination. We'll try and solve a three by three matrix A. The coefficients of may will be derived from, of course, the three equations. The first equation, second, and third are shown where my cursor is. For example, the first equation is 3x1 minus 0.1x2 minus 0.2x3 is 7.85, etc. Now, we can form the matrix A. The first row will be 3, negative 0 0.1, 0 0.2. The second row is 0 0.1, 7, negative 0.3. The third row is 0 0.3, negative 0.2, and 10. The right-hand side unknown vector will be 7.85, negative 19.3, and 71.4. It's a column vector. Our goal now is to do forward elimination. The first equation is essentially fine as itself, because it's part of the upper triangle. The first problem, of course, will be the second equation. We would want to multiply our first equation, 3.1 in this case, by 0.1 over 3 and subtract the result from, say, equation the second equation. This yields this second equation result. 7.03333x2 minus 0.29333x3 equals the right-hand side negative 19.5617. We'll then multiply equation 3.1, that is the first equation in the series, by 0.3 over 3. Why? Because of course we're trying to equate these two particular equations so we can subtract them and eliminate the term uh, a21. Once we do this subtraction, the operations and new set of equations will be shown here. This is the first set, and we have removed the first element of the second equation of the element matrix A. We'll have now the new second equation, the first one's unmodified, as 0 plus 7.0333x2 minus 0.293333x3 equals the new right-hand side, negative 19.5617. The third equation's unchanged. But you see, the third equation, of course, also has essentially an unknown coefficient. We now do complete the forward elimination, and we need to change and get rid of a32 coefficient of negative 0.19. There's multiple ways to do this. Let's try and remove from new equation, the third one, multiplying the second equation of the new matrix by negative 0 0.190000 divided by 7.0003. Where do we get these two fractions? Well, they're, of course, the elements A22 and A23. By taking this ratio and multiplying through and subtracting the equations, you can see we can eliminate A32. That's awesome. And once we do this operation and replace the third equation, we'll now have the upper triangular and we've completed the forward elimination. You should try these steps yourself because of course you can see the numerics and exact operations. Now that we have this um, upper triangle, we can do the backward substitution. We always start, if we have an upper triangle matrix, with the third equation. 10.0120x3 equals 70.0843. Divide both sides by 10.0120 and you'll get x3. Here we have done this for you. Now we can take x3 in its form and backwards substitute in the second equation for x3. We now have an equation of 7.00333x2 minus 0.29333x3 
0.293333 times 7.0003 equals negative 19.5617. We can, of course, now have a closed form equation for x2. We evaluate that and get negative 2.50. We now know x3 and x2. We can substitute that in the first equation. And of course, now we only have an equation for x1. That's shown down here. Now, the hard part has been done, of course, and we can explicitly solve with the numerics for x1. We'll have a solution of 3, negative 2.5, and 7.00003. Now, there's a slight round off error because, of course, we used a computer to evaluate these numerics. The results are very close to the exact values. The exact solution of this particular set of equations, if you've done it analytically on paper, will be x1 of 3, x2 of negative 2.5, and x3 of 7. So you can see by using Gaussian elimination, and evaluating the equations with round off error because of the computer, we actually have some error in our solution. X3 is, should be 7, but it's of course here 7.00003. You can see linear algebra solvers that use these type of elimination techniques on computers also have numerical round off error. Let's turn our attention to another popular approach, which is the so-called lower upper decomposition. Let's once again examine this equation ax equals b. The object of lower upper decomposition is trying to reduce the order of the system and reduce the number and distance of the off diagonals from the main diagonal. This is used primarily in CFD for the so-called preconditioning techniques, which we will talk more about in the class. Remember, preconditioning techniques are especially useful for transonic and creeping flows. We'll rewrite this system, ax equals b, as a lower triangle and upper triangle for example. We can write LU is A. So we want to take A and decompose it into a lower and upper triangular matrix. The new system of equations can be written like this on the left. L operating on U of X minus D will be AX minus B. If we can write our system as this LU system, we might give an example for 3 by 3 here. We might once again now have something which we can do backwards substitution on in a very simple way. So you can see by doing the LU decomposition, we have skipped the very expensive and difficult forward elimination part of Gaussian elimination. And we would arrive at an upper triangle, which has non-zero coefficients like in this example on the left with unknown vector x and right-hand side d. So instead of right-hand side b, we would have a modified right-hand side d with a modified upper triangle. The lower triangle, of course, would have lower elements with unity along the main diagonal, and the lower elements would be L21, etc. So this is all well and good, but how does it help linear algebra solvers? Well, you see the linear lower upper decomposition approach is going to result in a more efficient technique than the Gaussian elimination technique, both numerically and computationally, and more computationally efficient. So here's a graphical example of the so-called LU decomposition of technique, which in my opinion is the best way to understand it. The first step will of course be factorization. Then we take A and we'll factor it into an upper and lower matrix. This is a rather simple and straightforward operation based on the definition of simply L and U. We would then set X equals to B. We would then take L and find some vector D. So you multiply through L, which is simple to find, multiply through some vector D and for unknown B. So now we're taking the lower matrix and essentially doing a substitution technique to find D. We then take D and set it equal to the right hand side of U times X and set it to D. Then we can do, of course, the backward substitution here. Once we do that backward substitution, we would have, of course, our result X. Look at this gra graphically for a few minutes, and I think that beauty and genius of the technique will be familiar and interesting to you. So let's look at this in written steps. The first step of LU factorization is that A is factored or decomposed into the lower and upper triangular matrices. This is trivial to do based on our definitions of L and U. You can imagine how easy it is. We just take simply the upper part of A and the lower part of U and separate them out. It's one of the most easy operations. Set the diagonal of L to zero, excuse me, unity. Then we will substitute L and U. This is the so-called substitution steps. They are used to determine a solution x for a right-hand side vector b. Itself, this consists of two steps, much like Gaussian elimination. It's used through the generation of the intermediate vector d, which is slow, shown in the middle of this slide on 14. It's found by simply forward substituting the results. 
Then, of course, the result is back substituted to find the solution x. You can simply try this for the same 3 by 3 matrix we used for Gaussian elimination to get a hang of it. The first step, remember, is defining u and l, which is simple, and then finding the matrix D based on L with the original vector B. This is basically a substitution approach, a forward. And then, of course, D is used in the backward substitution. There's, of course, a mathematical proof that shows that this is always correct. We've now talked about direct solvers. Let's turn our attention to iterative linear algebra solvers. These are typically used for very, very, very large matrices A. A direct solver, even if it's sparse, has a lot of trouble of working on A and finding a solution. And there's many famous examples of these types of solvers. Now, there's a number of interesting solvers that we're going to look at. And we'll look at one very simple one in a few minutes. Relative to direct solvers, which are considered implicit solvers, much like the methods we previously talked about, these are completely explicit. They use very little memory and are much simpler to program, which is wonderful, and um, especially for CFD when you're implementing a new solver. They're very easy to program, but they might not converge. They might have stability problems. If they do converge, for certain types of linear algebra problems, they are very, very fast compared to implicit solvers. Unfortunately, their convergence is not guaranteed, and it could take a long time, and they could diverge, which of course is wasted your time. So the way to understand this is, of course, to understand the matrix properties of A. That is, there's a whole field of linear algebra and mathematical theory which will tell you if these iterative techniques for sparse matrices especially, which are appropriate for CFD, can be used. There are some famous examples. One is called conjugate gradient, another one is called general mean residual with a number of look back vectors r, and one we're going to look in this class called SCREE, which is not so famous. SCREE actually isn't an acronym, it's just a joke that if you're walking up a mountain, you might take two steps forward and slide one back. You'll eventually get to the top of the mountain, which is your solution, but you'll be doing a lot of backtracking because you're sliding down the mountain. SCREE is actually a slang for a type of um, rocks in a mountain that are kind of like gravel, which you might slip on. Now, we can run these par solvers in parallel. You can also run direct solvers in parallel, which we just talked about. And there's specialized libraries and programs and teams of mathematicians and computer scientists who have programmed all this for you. You might try one. One's called, perhaps, SuperLU, which represents a parallelization of the LU algorithm, which we just showed you. That would be a direct solver. An iterative solver can usually run in parallel and be efficient, very written very efficiently in parallel with very small amounts of memory and overhead. This is why they're favored in computational fluid dynamics, if they work. We'll examine one particular solver of the iterative approach now. We'll look at the so-called Scree algorithm. Now, the Scree algorithm depends on a pseudo time step, and we'll be looking at an example equation, which is analogous to the heat equation, which we looked at earlier in these classes. Here's our equation. Now, our original equation we want to solve, of course, is the linear algebra problem, ax equals b. Now, a is really an operator on x. If we add a partial derivative with respect to time to a and let it operate in x, we've modified our system. We've essentially taken a steady problem and made it a pseudo steady problem. So for example, now our new system of equation is partial x partial t plus ax equals b. Now, if x is not changing in time, partial x partial t will go to zero. What does that mean? Well, we've basically say that if x is not changing with time, then ax equals b is partial x partial t is zero. And therefore, we can say that x is the solution if we drive partial x partial t to zero. That's an interesting philosophy. This is like a so-called pseudo time marching approach. This is done in CFD for steady problems, which we'll talk, we've already talked about in a previous class. Here, of course, we are doing it to a linear algebra problem. So we've applied the pseudo time marching approach to something a little bit different, which is the solution of linear algebra. We now define a residual. The residual, of course, might be measured as a minimization of ax minus b. That's the right-hand side of the original equation. That's really what we try and minimize. So the Scree algorithm can be written in a very simple way. We simply take the pseudo-time marching approach, pseudo-time, and discretize it using an explicit Euler with right-hand side residuals. So we'll write x to the n plus 1 minus xn, that's the solution to iteration n plus 1 minus the current solution, all over some time step delta t. A delta t can be chosen to be a small value. 
This is just an explicit Euler scheme. On the right-hand side, we'll simply write two times the residual of x to the n minus the residual of x to the n minus one. This is a name for scree. These are two coefficients which we arbitrarily chose. Why? Because, of course, it has certain stability characteristics. We can actually choose whatever coefficients we want. We can choose small or big, negative or positive times, because it can go in any direction, it doesn't matter. And of course, there's these two values. Of course, there's a stability analysis that can be performed. This is a linear equation and linear discretization. So we can perform stability analysis for a certain set of coefficients a and b and find stability requirements. In practice, this is just done much easier by trial and error. And that's the algorithm. So you can imagine we choose some initial value for x and advance in time to x to large values of n. As the residual becomes very, very, very small and goes to zero and stops changing, then we would know that, of course, because xn is, and xn minus 1 are not changing, the residual not changing, and of course that means the partial derivative of x with time would be going to zero, and we would have our solution. This is extremely easy to program. All you would have to do is choose two solutions x and x minus 1. You could actually just set the whole solution to zero initially um, at two time levels and find a new time level and advance in time. It's an explicit formulation. So we would solve xn plus 1 equals xn plus delta t times the quantity 2r at xn minus r of xn minus 1. Let's look at a flow chart of this process on the right. We would initialize our solution and then we would go and set the two new residuals r n minus 1 minus r. That's easy. That's our choice. We would then update the new residual, r n equals a x n minus b, which is shown in this equation. Next, we would find the new time level, or the updated solution, x to the n plus 1 equals x n plus delta t times 2 r n minus r n minus 1, which is this equation here. It's the explicit formulation. If we're running in parallel, we would update the new solution on all the processors, and we'll talk about parallel processing in in a later module. We would then also set and update x to the n, that is the current simulation time, with the time in the future so that we can reapply the method. We would then check for convergence, that is we would look at the residual and see if it's going to zero. If it's not, we would repeat the whole process over and over again and advance in time to very large values of n. If our convergence check is passed, that is the residual is small, then of course we would say that we're done and we have the final solution xn. Let's look at some examples of the implementation of the Scree algorithm. We might implement this algorithm in parallel. The serial implementation is trivial. The Scree algorithm can run in serial or parallel. It doesn't matter. It's trivial to parallelize because it's what we call embarrassingly parallel. We'll talk more about this later. In a serial ca calculation, meaning it's all run on one processor, it all the calculations shown in the algorithm previously displayed will run on a single processor. The matrix A will be stored in what we call CSR format, which is a sparse matrix format. You can read more about this in sparse matrix books. It's just an efficient way of storing a matrix with very few non-zero elements. We would then run a parallel implementation if we desire to speed up the process. We can parallelize the code graphically by looking at the matrix A. Imagine this block here where my cursor is as the matrix A. X is the unknown vector. The right-hand side is the unknown, or the right-hand side B. So, B is not changing with iterations, so we would take each part of B and send it to, say, for three processors, B0, B1, and B2. B0 would be stored in the memory on processor 0, B1 would be stored on a processor of processor 1, and part of the matrix B2 would be stored on the processor, say, 2. There's three processors, so we divide B into three parts and send each part to different processors. They can then communicate through the Ethernet or high-speed network uh, of computers or with internally on um, you know the networks of the motherboard. X must be known across all processors. So all processors must know about X, XN, X minus one, and the new XN plus one in all iterations. And so they're gonna be passing that information back and forth. Processor zero, one, and two can divide A based on the row approach. The first set, say one third of A, will be stored on processor zero, the second third processor one, and the third third of the matrix A, that is the last block of rows, would be stored on processor two, processors zero, one, and two. There's three processors. You note, I don't call processor the first processor processor one. 
in the computer science and nomenclature of parallel computing, typically the first processor is called processor zero. You can note that A, the coefficients of A in the iterative system, and B do not change. If we use a, say, direct solver, we would have to be updating the coefficients in A as the solver progresses. These are divided evenly across processors, which reduces memory, of course, on a per-processor basis. This way, the coefficients are never changed, and each processor never has to tell other processors what the coefficients are. This is a basic parallelization. Now, as the solver progresses, the, say, processor zero will only be updating values of x in its range of the first values of x. The second processor would only update values of x in the second third of x, and processor two, the last processor, would only update values of x in its third uh, part of x, of course. After each iteration, they exchange values of x, and they all know the new updated values of x. Let's look at some parallel results just to get a taste of this. Say we have a randomly generated sparse test matrix of order 100,000, just as a test. It has complex coefficients, so A might have complex values. This is normal in CFD for certain types of problems. So every value or element A might have two parts, a real part and imaginary part. B might also have complex parts. For example, it might be 1 plus 1i at each xi. The sparsity of the matrix might be 0 0.0001. Sparsity of the matrix is defined as the number of non-zero elements in A divided by the total number of elements in A. So that means only 0.001% of the matrix has a non-zero element. It's a very sparse matrix. This means that there's about an average of 10 non-zero values in each row of the matrix A, which is on the order of 100,000. So the matrix A has 100,000 squared elements. We'll set a convergence criteria. We'll say that the L2 norm, which we discussed in the previous class, that's the root mean square of the total residual, will be 1 times 10 to the negative 17th. That's a very, very strict requirement. It would require a double precision complex arithmetic for the solver. We'll set the time step to be negative 1.6 times 10 to negative 2. Remember, this is a pseudo time step. It does not matter physically if we're going in the negative time direction or positive time direction. It's chosen only for stability. And if we try this approach, it'll take 39,547 iterations for the solver to converge. That means n is equal to 39,547 when we achieve this convergence criteria of 1 times 10 to the negative 17th. There could, of course, be potential improvements in the parallelization using different types of parallel libraries and strategies. Don't worry about that for now. Let's go back. In this algorithm, this loop and convergence check has been run, and solutions have been updated 39,547 times to find this solution of a vector x of size 100,000. Now, if we use the parallelization technique, which I showed on a previous slide, we might examine how fast we can find a solution with respect to time. For example, if I use one processor and it's run in serial, it will have a normalized time of one. If I double number of processors and split the pro program across two CPUs and corresponding memory, then I solve the problem in about approximately 68% of the time. If I use three processors, I'm nearing 50%. If I use 16 processors, I solve the problem, of course, in about 30% of the time. This is certainly not an ideal parallelization, but it is embarrassingly parallel. The problem is, and why we're not getting a very good speed up of saying 50% for two processors, is because of the communication time between processors. The processors have to take time to talk to each other and trade data of the updated values of x. We'll see this more and discuss this more in the parallelization section of the class. You might also update types of in explicit methods for linear algebra by updating the left-hand side. Recall in the Scree algorithm, we had a partial derivative with respect to time. You might say, well, we've used explicit Euler here, but I know we have better convergence criteria and larger time steps and better stability for explicit methods, for example, like the Runge-Kutta method. 
Let's pretend that we implement the runge cut a method on the left-hand side of the Scree algorithm for the pseudo time derivative. So instead of an explicit Euler scheme, we might have a runge cut a scheme, a fourth order one. And this equation should look familiar to you because we've discussed the runge cut a scheme. Here's the same coefficients k1 through k4. We also have the same delta t, but this is a pseudo time. We can now set the delta t to a higher value and take larger time steps, reduce communication expense of the parallel program. This will result, of course, in larger time steps, which is good because we're approaching and reducing the pseudo time faster and the residual faster. It's going to use the same amount of memory in the computer. This is also good. And best of all, it will result in faster convergence, so we'll have many iterations less than 39,000. Here we've written, of course, the coefficients on the right. We can now compare the two algorithms, just for fun to give you an idea of what it means to have an iterative linear algebra solver, which is simple to implement. We've once again randomly generated a test matrix, but now of only order 1,000. There's complex coefficients which are placed randomly on the diagonal. The sparsity of the matrix will be 0 0.01. Now, B will be constructed, which is the right-hand side, so that the solution is 1 plus 1i. It's a complex solver. A is complex, and so is B. We devised a solution just to test the solver by setting the right-hand side excuse me, the solution to be 1 plus 1i, so it's complex at each value of i, and we're doing this just to test the solver. We then construct b and then try and solve for x. We will average about 10 non-zero values of each row of the solver, as already mentioned, and the convergence in, will be met with an L2 norm of, say, 10 to negative 17th. We'll choose a time step of negative 0.33, and of course, this time step is found through trial and error because the stability analysis is very difficult for this problem, and the stability would only depend on the coefficients in the matrix A on the right-hand side, which of course make up a system of equations, which we could apply a linear stability analysis. But we would have to do that numerically, obviously, because the order of the matrix is a thousand. That is, we have a thousand squared elements in the matrix. Let's look at a comparison of the convergence rate for the Scree algorithm using explicit Euler and the Scree algorithm using the runge cutta scheme. That is simply we replaced the pseudo partial time derivative in the Scree algorithm. On the x-axis, you have iteration. On the y-axis, you have normalized residual, the L2 norm. The Scree algorithm with explicit Euler is the black line. The runge cutta Scree algorithm on a per iteration basis is the dashed line. You can see just by the simple replacement, the convergence rate is much higher for Scree with the runge cutta scheme. For example, at 50, 50 iterations, we have a normalized residual of 0.25 versus about 0.5. That's half the residual and a good improvement for not much more computational power and work on our part. You can also see that we would consider these solutions converge at say 200 versus 300 iterations for about the same convergence criteria. Typically, this is a generally a good residual. I would personally like to have the residual run even longer and plot the normalized residual on a log linear plot so you could see it better. Here's that same log linear plot as I alluded to in the lower right. Now we've plotted log linear of L2 norm of iteration versus residual. You can see now that there's two different types of convergence rates. The slope of this RK Scree algorithm is much higher. This means, of course, that the RK Scree algorithm is much more computationally efficient relative to the Scree algorithm which uses the um, explicit Euler. Why is this also true, of course, because our case we can also use a larger time stop. That means its equivalent CFL number, if you use a, something like a unity for delta x and a delta t would be much larger. So delta t can be much larger if a runge cut a scheme, not only in the traditional time domain for nonlinear equations, but for the pseudo time marching algorithms for steady problems or linearized PDE. It's a really interesting mix of problems, but I love this problem because it's so simple and straightforward and it illustrates to students one of the most basic iterative techniques for solving a linear algebra problem. You can even solve this in MATLAB if you want. Try and make a complex matrix A of 10 by 10 with a right-hand side B and construct the solution X and see if you can reconstruct the solution and recover it through the solution of a Scree algorithm. In this class, we examined both iterative and direct methods for solving linearized systems. We also talked about the most basic linear algebra solvers of Gaussian elimination and LU decomposition. I encourage you to try some of these yourself and you'll try some of these in your homework. You'll also be able to try explicit 
iterative solvers like the Scree algorithm, or even more complicated ones which you can download from the internet that contain libraries of advanced solvers like GMRES, which of course are some of the workhorses of CFD. You'll also be able to implement and try some of these solver choices for linear algebra for the so-called loops around each iteration in CFD. You'll be able to choose something like GMRES. Now, next time, we'll talk about visualization. We'll talk about plotting, quantifying, and viewing quantities of CFD. We've up to this point talked about everything from grid generation, defining the problem, the boundary conditions, the equations of motion, how they're discretized, and how they're solved using nonlinear solvers, time marching solvers, linear algebra solvers, and we've produced the results. We've done grid independent studies, and of course we've looked at convergence. We Now we need to view the solution and see if it makes physical sense. If it does, then of course we can enter the third part of CFD, which is post-processing. And this is what many people consider the fun, colorful part of the program. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.